People Skid, how we doing? It's your boy Kobe back with another video. I hope you guys are having a blessed day. Today I have a great video for you guys. I'm gonna be talking about Jabari Parker versus Andrew Wiggins. For those who don't know, going into that 2014 NBA draft, it was a question whether you wanted Parker or Wiggins. And now it's interesting to see that both players in the league doing well, but I wonder, three years down the road, who we want on our team. So that's what I did in this video. I hope you guys enjoy it. Without further ado, let's get into it. Let me start this video with a question. Why is the NBA such a wonderful product? Why do we as fans consume the daily events of strangers who compete across a country that have no real impact on our everyday lives? Beyond the fact we've all had dreams since childhood to compete in a sport we love on the biggest stage, the NBA carries the brightest and youngest professional athletes in the world. Every year, players enter the league who are destined for greatness. And as fans, we feed into the hype because it is the future, not the present, that excites us. Before Andrew Wiggins became the poster boy of the Lota class of 2013, with his unparalleled length and raw athleticism at the high school level, garnering him comparison to players like Tracy McGrady, people often forget for a long period of time it was the Chicago native Jabari Parker getting the attention of the national media. In the spring of 2012, high school junior Jabari Parker captured his third straight title in three years. Attending the basketball powerhouse Simeon Career Academy, which produced the likes of Derrick Rose a few short years before, Parker was already arguably the most accomplished Illinois high school basketball player of all time. Noted for his polished offensive skill set at such a young age, scouts saw Jabari as the next NBA star. And in a move that was bold by any measure, Sports Illustrated put Jabari Parker on the cover of their magazine, titling him the best high school basketball prospect since LeBron James, bringing the hype to a whole nother level. But unfortunately for Jabari, a foot injury would cost him a majority of his senior season, and despite committing to Duke, and winning a fourth state title in four years once he returned, the hype train had died down quite a bit. A lot of that had to do with Canada's own Andrew Wiggins. After a huge summer at the Nike Peach Jam where it was clear he was only wasting more time in high school, Wiggins reclassified from the class of 2014 into the class of 2013, instantly dropping Parker to number two in the class. Although Wiggins entertained the thoughts of attending his parents' alma mater, Florida State, he ended up being swayed by Bill Self from the Kansas Jayhawks. By the time he graduated, he too was also being noted the best prospect since LeBron. With a decision to reclassify, Wiggins unknowingly interlinked his career with Jabari's as two players who have received an abundant amount of praise for their games before ever stepping on the NBA court. In comparing the two players, I broke it down into two sections, comparing them from when they were drafted to the present and then comparing the present to the future, or where I think each will eventually get to in their prime considering where they're at right now. Skipping over college where both Wiggins and Parker had productive yet uneventful freshman campaigns, let us take a look at what the NBA scouts believe to be the main facets of their game prior to the 2014 NBA draft. Before making comparison between the two players, I think it makes sense to see where these players were and how their games have evolved since. Looking at Andrew Wiggins as a prospect in 2014, Draft Express believed the strengths of Andrew Wiggins included his physical tools, his slashing potential, shooting ability, defense, and upside. Of course, there's really nothing about his physical tools that have changed since he's entered the league, so let's focus on the four categories. In regards to his slashing potential, Wiggins has definitely lived up to the hype as a player who's able to attack the teeth of the defense and finish at a height above the reach of most defenders due to his great size. From reviewing the tape of his drives, you see one of his favorite go-to moves in this area of the floor is the spin move off a hard drive that he's able to complete spinning left or spinning right. At the rim, Wiggins sports a career 64.8 field goal percentage, a very good number for an NBA shooting guard. Attacking the closeout is another successful area for Wiggins, as his quick Quickness makes it look far too easy blowing by the defender when they are anticipating the shot. But let's focus on his shot now. At Kansas, Wiggins certainly had a share of big nights by heavily utilizing the three ball alongside his driving prowess. Due to his ability to rise up among nearly anyone that guards him, Wiggins had been billed as a player with potential to be a future great shooter at the NBA level. But has this actually come to reality? The answer is, it's a mixed bag. Inconsistency with the jump shot has plagued Wiggins so far in his career, and it has certainly affected his overall field goal percentage. While at times in individual stretches it looks like Wiggins is an elite shooter in the NBA, he'll come back down to earth on a night where he doesn't have it going, opting to defer to teammates Carl Anthony Towns or Zach Levine. Along with this, the NBA three-point shot hasn't been his best friend up to now in the league as he sports a 32.2% three-point field goal percentage. The last two attributes on Wiggins' game, defense and upside, really go hand in hand. Apart from his ability to score offensively and develop a game that resembles the look of an NBA all-star, scouts tied the potential for Wiggins to become an elite on-ball and off-ball defender as a result of his physical tools. Surprisingly, this is far from the case at this point in his career as Wiggins has been underwhelming on this side of the ball. You think the passing lane for opposing guards would be dangerous territory going up against Wiggins, but he hasn't been very impactful, only producing one steal per game per 36 minutes. Beyond this though, the effort level on a consistent basis while playing defense both on the ball and off the ball is something that will need to improve before seeing any type of improvement on defense. So despite having plenty of room to improve, there's no doubt Wiggins has put his mark on the NBA as a solid volume scorer that looks to improve in the coming years. Now, Jabari Parker's evolution from college to the NBA was a bit more complicated. Apart from missing almost an entire rookie season because of a torn ACL, 
scouts didn't know exactly where Jabari would fit in the league position wise. At 6'9 with fluid handles, impressive footwork, and overall solid fundamentals heading into the NBA draft, there is optimism that Jabari could play multiple positions, namely either the 3 or the stretch 4 on several occasions. And that has really become a reality for the Milwaukee Bucks, who have several players who fit the mold of players who function best as positionless type players. One of the major strengths scouts saw for Jabari moving into the league was his offensive versatility, essentially being able to score in a variety of ways. After displaying a consistent ability to score the rock at Duke, many people believe Jabari was the most NBA ready player in the entire draft in the sense that he could provide you dependable scoring from day one. However, once he returned from his ACL injury, Jabari seemed very hesitant to take outside jump shots. Instead, he opted to focus his play around the rim. Last season, Jabari's average distance on field goals attempted was a mere 7.7 feet, surprisingly low for a player who carried a refined offensive repertoire. I bet Jason Kidd and the Bucks definitely wanted Jabari to take more jumpers to help space the floor, but Jabari's paint presence actually challenged one of his main perceived weaknesses coming into this draft, his explosiveness. While the confidence that he once boasted in his ability to take deep contested shots at Duke was gone for the time being, Jabari had surprised just about everyone with his explosion and decisiveness around the rim. Just about any time Jabari got near the rim, he's either looking to dunk or aggressively finish with a quick burst of speed and athleticism. In fact, I'm sure many fans of the NBA would list Jabari as one of their favorite dunkers in the league, which is crazy to me considering how much I and I'm sure many viewers remember his explosiveness being a major weakness in his draft profile coming out of college. Towards the end of last season and the start of this year, Jabari started to put the scoring together like most scouts envisioned. After the 2015 All-Star break, Jabari averaged nearly 20 points a game while beginning to bring his jump shot back into the fold. And this season, Jabari has extended his shot beyond the three-point line, slowly bringing back the versatility that scouts talked about during his time at Duke. All in all, like Wiggins, it has also been a promising start for Jabari in his NBA career. So now, where does that leave us in predicting the future development of these two players and who's going to end up being the better player? Instead of discussing who's the better player right now, I think it's more interesting to develop a rating as to what the player's peak future output looks like in comparison to what they're already doing. In doing so, I've created four categories that I determine to be the most influential in determining the heights of their future NBA success. They are potential to improve in scoring, potential to improve ability to create for others, potential to improve defense, and potential to improve intangibles. Rating each category on a five point scale, I will add each up for both and that will determine the overall prospect from their current production. Getting right into it, the first category is the potential to improve in scoring. This category simply is taking a look at the current scoring output from both players and what we can expect from them in the future as a result. Starting first with Jabari, he is currently averaging 20 20.7 points per game and 5.7 rebounds a game at a field goal clip of 49.8% along with an outstanding 41.4 three-point field goal percentage. When we look at his per 36 minute scoring rate, his scoring climbs to 21.8 points per game. As is evident from game tape and stats, he's already a good score at age 21, but how much can we expect for this to increase? I think there's a very good case we made for Jabari to see his scoring increase in the next few years. Along with continuing to adjust to the speed of the game, I think you're going to see him add new elements to his offense. He made major improvements to the mid-range and three-point shot in one offseason, and there's no doubt he will increase the shot attempts from this area as he gets more comfortable. I think a fair comparison to be made in this context is seeing how Blake Griffin expanded his game after his first few seasons in the league. After relying heavily on his athleticism and explosiveness early in his career, Griffin slowed down in the dunks department and really honed in on his mid-range game, becoming one of the best pick and pop forwards in the league. Also, considering how big he is, the fact that Jabari hasn't really developed a low post game to complement his size advantage is a scary thought since the Bucks have him playing mostly on the perimeter. When Parker does go inside, he really just muscles his way down there against smaller guys. So honestly, I don't see how scoring doesn't go up. With all that being being said, I'm going to say Jabari's potential improvement scoring is a 4.5 out of 5, with projected point per game at his prime around 25-26 points per game. Now looking at Wiggins, Wiggins is currently averaging 22 points per game and 4.3 rebounds a game at a field goal clip of 44.5% and a 35% 3-point field goal percentage, while also having player efficiency at 15.31. The per 36 minute scoring rate is 21.5 points per game. So when looking at Wiggins' offensive game, I would actually argue the game has slowed down for him a little bit more than Jabari at this point. His game is very smooth in the half court, he's very comfortable in the mid-range, and can rise up from either his left or right side of his shoulder. I already mentioned his ability to get to the rim and he gets the line at a good clip, currently sitting at 16th in the league at 6.5 free throw attempts per game. Discounting the fact that he has to share the ball with Carl Anthony Towns and Zach Levine, two guys that also average 20 points a game, Wiggins is still only attempting 17.6 field goal attempts, a number that could rise in a few years. Looking at it from this angle, there is historical precedent from similar guards like Wiggins to see his scoring increase. Yet the one caveat I will mention expressing confidence in Wiggins' ability to increase his scoring production is he might do so in a less efficient manner than Parker. A very relevant point in discussion the growth of NBA score. As of now, Wiggins is a pure volume scorer, so he'll need to improve his efficiency to maximize his potential. So that being said, I'm going to give him a slightly less score, 4 out of 5, in potential to prove in scoring. I see his peak projected points per game around 25 points. Number 2 is the potential to prove ability to create for others, and this is an area that is actually weakness for both of these players at the moment. At the moment for Jabari, he averages 2.6 assists per game. Now I know he's a small forward, 
but star players are held to a higher standard because they are responsible for the play of their teammates. Despite the low number, he does have solid passing instincts and can set up players off the drive as you see here with the dish to Malcolm Brogdon in the corner. Having said this, there are times where he gets tunnel vision and does not look to make the pass in a situation he probably should. In his current situation, Jabari isn't asked to set up his teammates as a result of playing with Giannis and his new addition Matthew Della Vadova. This clearly limits the upside and desire for Jabari to reach a level which he creates for others that's ever above average. Not to say he isn't capable, I just don't foresee it as a major part of his game going forward. So for that, I'm going to give Jabari a 2.5 out of 5 on his potential to prove his ability to create for others. So Wiggins isn't much better in the assist department. He's only averaging 2.3 assists per game this season and a career 2.1 assist average for his career. Honestly, I think the reason why Wiggins doesn't average a lot of assists can be attributed to his situation on the Timberwolves, but I also think it could be his emphasis on his sole focus on looking to score the rock at this stage in his career. Truth be told, Wiggins isn't an amazing ball handler and really only moves while dribbling in a straight line fashion. He also only assists on 9% of his team's field goal makes while he's in the game, so there's almost no effort put towards setting up other players on the court while he's in. Of course, having ball dominant guards like Ricky Rubio, who's one of the league leaders in assist percentage doesn't help his case. Projecting his future, I think there's a little more optimism for Wiggins in increasing this part of his game. As a shooting guard, Wiggins will have the opportunity to control the ball from the perimeter, and as the game further develops, I can see him being a facet of his game, he'll actually look to improve more than Parker. So that being said, I'm gonna give Wiggins a three out of five in this area. Now looking at defense, the other side of the ball is an interesting story. Coming out of college, draft scouts listed one of Jabari's biggest weaknesses was his ability to guard opposing NBA players. The issue in particular was, who is he going to guard? You see, he's big for a three, but his below average lateral quickness would have him susceptible to easy dribble penetration from a small forward, and for a four, he's a bit quicker but doesn't quite have the body and length of a pure physical big. So Jabari never projected to be a good defender in the league, and in review of his tape, he pretty much lived up to what we were going to expect. I will say while I was watching the Cavs Bucks a couple weeks ago, I noticed Jabari guard LeBron the entire night, and he actually did a half decent job forcing LeBron to take outside shots instead of allowing his penetration. Having said that, what I think is more concerning for Jabari is his lack of rebounding so far in his career, an area that he showed immense potential for at Duke. On the season, Jabari is averaging a paltry 5.6 rebounds a game, something that needs to pick up if he really isn't going to be a plus defender most nights. Overall, as most young players do, I can see Jabari improving his defense to an average grade at his overall peak, but this will also largely depend on his willingness and effort level to grab some damn rebounds and play with a high motor. Even with that though, I don't get too excited on his overall potential to improve his defense at an elite level because there's definitely a cap of what he'll provide for the reasons I already listed. So for that, I'm going to give him a 3 out of 5 on his potential to improve his defense. Andrew Wiggins has a different level upside on this side of the ball. As I already touched on, NBA draft scouts did not hide their excitement of his potential to dominate on this side of the ball due to his physical tools, but he hasn't reached that elite level quite yet. There have been flashes of his on-ball defensive potential, but there's something to be said for a player having a buy-in to give him the same effort level every time out there. For Wiggins, this is incredibly apparent in his game. Game tape shows plenty of example of his ability to provide quality defensive production every night, but it really is going to be a matter of his desire to work on making defense as important as offense. There is no excuse for Wiggins to have such poor defensive stats, but at age 21, there's still plenty of time to improve his habits. With a defensive minded coach and Tom Thibodeau, he's going to get every opportunity to develop his defensive game into the juggernaut we expected out of college. And at this stage, I really do think Wiggins will eventually become a problem on the defensive end. So that being said, I'm going to give Wiggins a perfect score of 5 out of 5 on its potential to prove his defense, a sheer reflection of his God-gifted potential to be one of the league's best defenders. So let's review what we have so far. For potential to prove in scoring, I have Parker at 4.5 out of 5 against Wiggins 4 out of 5. Potential to create for others favors Wiggins slightly at 3 out of 5 to Parker's 2.5 out of 5. And potential to prove on defense, we have Wiggins at 5 out of 5 to Parker's 3 out of 5. In total, that gives Wiggins a two-point lead before getting into the final category of intangibles. So, getting right into intangibles, this is an area that is incredibly important in rounding up the overall status of a player as an NBA star. Intangibles include everything from leadership skills, having the clutch factor, and general work ethic. There have been many players in the league that have had a very promising start to their career, yet ultimately settling in as good but not great NBA players. Good examples of this include 2009-2010 Rookie of the Year Tyreek Evans and 2008-2009 Rookie of the Year runner-up OJ Mayo, who is now currently banned from the NBA for the next two years. Having said this, intangible is also one of the hardest measures to quantify because there's so much as NBA fans we are not privy to. How does a player respond to coaches in practice? How badly does a player want to be great? These are tough questions to answer, but let's try and see what has been said about Wiggins and Parker to determine their overall intangibles. Of course, Shibari is known by many as a high character guy off the court, a player who gets excellent reviews from just about every coach he's played for. As we can see from his development in a short time in the league, Parker carries a very good work ethic to go along with his talent. As I mentioned earlier, it took him only one full offseason to become a 40% three-point shooter halfway through the NBA season. That's pretty impressive. So what knocks exist on Parker, if any, in relation to his intangibles? As of now, the biggest weakness Jabari faces is his ability to take over towards the late stretch of fourth quarter. On the season, Parker ranks 80th in the NBA in fourth quarter points per game at only 3.7 a contest. While it's clear Parker possesses offensive skills naturally fit for 
late game situations. He's played a deferring role to the Bucks' other young star Giannis, as Giannis averages a whooping 6.5 points per game in the fourth quarter. Nonetheless, overall, Jabari's vast improvement over the last year in pretty much every area makes me confident he will eventually begin to impose his will towards the end of games. In this area, I'm going to have to give him a 4 out of 5 in relation to improving his intangibles. Wiggins is another guy who has gotten credit from coaches and players for his excellent work ethic. Despite struggling somewhat in the advanced statistics department, Wiggins has showed he has the ability to replicate similar moves from players from putting hours in the gym. NBA trainer Drew Hamlin spoke at length about Wiggins' learning curve, saying Andrew's ability to retain new information and translate into gameplay right away is what makes him special. But at the same time, Wiggins has had issues of his own developing the inner mentality of a franchise player. While at Kansas, NBA scouts wondered whether Wiggins could be the consistent alpha male for a winning ball club. And it's even a justifiable point today. With Carl Anthony Towns and Zach Levine becoming household names across the league, Wiggins finds himself fighting for his spot as a quintessential building block on the T-Wolves, something that seemed unquestioned just a year ago. So while I think Wiggins truly does want to be great, and it appears he is putting in the work, at least on the surface, I have more questions on his intangibles than Parker, and for that reason I'm going to give him a 3 out of 5. So in tallying up the final scores of the last category intangibles, we finished the final score of Jabari 14 and Andrew Wiggins with a score of 15. Remember, this is a score measuring their overall potential if they were to both reach their peak. So what that means is, if Andrew Wiggins and Jabari Parker both maximize their ability to improve from their current standing, it looks like the way that I grade it that I think Wiggins still possesses a slightly higher upside down the road. Having said this, in reality from watching both players play this season and taking into account the context of each player's situation, I personally believe Jabari has a higher chance to reach his ceiling than Wiggins, and I would take him over Wiggins at this point point for our starting franchise. My reasoning is twofold. In short, the Milwaukee Bucks have established the blueprints of success that put Jabari Parker alongside Giannis as the two franchise players that the team is going to build around for the next decade. The team's path to the top two or three teams in the Eastern Conference is well within reach in the next couple years, and a lot of it has to do with Jabari's improving play. I like Wiggins, and I've already touched on it at length. He has a world of potential that really builds on a skill set, but I think there's a chance Wiggins' development gets stuck in limbo while competing with all the other young talent in Minnesota. I mean, let's be real. Lottery pick Chris Dunn still hasn't received significant minutes yet. Once he does, there are just so many many ball dominant players on this team and I think Wiggins might have to relinquish some of that on ball development in order for better team success. And even regardless of the situation, I like Jabari's growth more than Wiggins' growth so far in the league. I'm not a big advanced statistics guy, but they heavily favor Jabari in a lot of areas and it do mean something. Both still have a lot of work to do, but if I were a betting man, I'll take Jabari as a player who finished with a better career starting from this point. So there you guys have it, Jabari Parker versus Andrew Wiggins revisited today in 2017. My thoughts on the matter? I think Andrew Wiggins is a great player, but personally, I think Jabari Parker is going to be something special, and I think he's proven it this year especially, and even towards the end of last season. Whether you're a Wiggins guy or a Jabari guy, or playing at a really high level, coming out of the college, coming out of the NBA, or pretty much fulfilling expectations of what we thought they were being. So that's really great for the rivalry and just for basketball in general. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I really enjoyed making it. It was a blast to make. Um, if you enjoyed the video, drop a like down below. Subscribe if you like basketball videos. We will make a ton of basketball videos in the coming months. Also, give me your thoughts down below. What did you guys think of the video? What do you guys think of the Jabari Wiggins rivalry? I'd love to hear it down below. Anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed, and I'll catch you on the next one. Deuces. Yeah.